ladies and gentlemen, this morning is what we are calling it Stronger Together. If you look at the bulletin, it says Stronger Together. What we do is we spend the first Sunday of every year. We take the first Sunday of every year. We begin the same way, focusing on the commitment that we made, not only when we said yes and became part of this amazing church family, but more importantly, we fo we're focusing on the commitment that we made when we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Today is a day that we talk all about the importance of being a vital part of a church family. This is a morning, I'm really hoping it's a moment of encouragement. It's moments of encouragement, but stronger than that, I also pray it's a time of challenge. As we look deeper, how do we spend our time? How do we use our resources? Does our Saturday night match up with our Sunday morning? So let me ask this question as we dive in just a few moments <coughs> this morning. What does your commitment with Jesus Christ look like? Think about that. What does your commitment with Jesus look like? Now, there you could be here. And you serve so much. You are involved here in your church. You're involved in home. you got things going on here. You, God is blessing you. And we are so honored and excited about all those people that do so much in our church family. And we cannot say thank you enough. But it's still always good to evaluate. It's still good to ask ourselves the question, where am I really committed? You could be here today. You are committed to your tradition. For you, it's all about tradition. The pastor, one of the former pastors said we did it this way, so this is the way we have to do them. We have to dress like this. We have to act like this. And you here are all about tradition. That could be it. You could be here today and you're committed to convenience. God will give you an hour a week. That's really all we got. We have sports. You don't understand, God. We got sports. I got my Netflix shows. I mean, there's a lot going on, God. So I'll give you one hour a week. You're here today. You could be committed to your comfort zone. That's what's important to you. Your comfort zone. Okay, I'll go. I'll, okay, God, I'll go to church. I'll go, but don't don't make me work with the kids. You know I me. Mean? You know me, God. That's not my thing. Or don't don't make me be a, a greeter. Don't make me be an usher. Don't make me do. I'll go, but I don't want to get involved. Or you're here, and it's all about your self-image, right? How you look. You're obsessed with the outside when you don't really care too much about the inside. But let me hear, let me tell you, Jesus is the exact opposite. He cares about the inside. The outside, you can wear what you want. Maybe you're here today, you're committed to your possessions. You were more excited about that newest phone, iPhone 29, or whatever they're at now, I don't know. <laughs> they're getting close. I feel like they just keep adding this. It's great. I think you're 15 or 16, too. The new iPhone, that's about you. The new the PlayStation 9 is out. You know, you got to get that one too, or whatever it is. You got to have the newest car, the newest stuff. So for you, it's all about your stuff. So where are you really committed? Where do you invest your time? Where do you focus your energy? Allow me this morning <laughs> to give you another option. You could be committed to all those things, but let me encourage you instead of those things to be committed to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6. Our Savior is talking. Jesus himself is talking. I'm going to read one verse. It's perhaps one of the most popular verses in the book of Matthew. It's Matthew chapter 6, 33. Again, Jesus is talking. He says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I grew up memorizing verses like this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is first, ladies and gentlemen. First. So as you look through what, what you do, how you act, how you talk, what, where you invest your time, what are you seeking first today? What are you seeking first today? You see, to be committed to Jesus means you have his will ahead of your wants. It means your, his, I'm sorry, his calling on your life is your number one Priority, your number one agenda. Obedience to him is the driving force of your life. It's obedience to Jesus 
drives how you talk to others. Obedience to Jesus means changes how you drive, how you act, how you speak. It changes everything. The, the, your relationship with Jesus is the most important relationship you have. Everyone remembers their wedding day, right? <coughs> Go back in your mind to your wedding day. It's an amazing day. It rained on ours. Remember? It rained on our wedding day, which I think they mean, I think that's supposed to, we don't believe it a lot, but I think that means it's supposed to be, well, we're still married, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that first dance. Remember the first dance? Your wedding day, by the way, is today. All your family, your friends, moms, dads, people have known you since before you were born. They're all there. Everyone is there. And then you get to that first dance. And we're, not, we're Baptists, but we still can talk about this. Get that away. So you're there. You're having your first dance. You know when you have that first dance? Think about that. Those moms and dads who held you, who fed you. Those brothers and sisters who've been your best friend all those years. That BFF of yours, all those people that mean so much to you. Well, when you have that first dance, they all fade away, don't they? They all fade away. Why? Because you didn't make a commitment to them. You made a commitment to your spouse, your new spouse, your new husband, your new wife. There's people in our world today. We're trying to look so good. For people we never made any commitments to. We're trying to look so good, spending so much time on how we look, how we act. As a Christian, you didn't make commitments to that. You made it to him. <coughs> those sports, those hobbies where I, we, I invest, we invest so much time, money, effort. <laughs> they can't offer you anything eternal. There's millions of people in our world today. They attend church, but they're not committed. Should be like singing the songs. They like hearing the sermon. Maybe they like the friendships. But they, they still don't want the responsibility. They don't, want, they, don't, they don't want to deal with anything. They don't want the commitment. They don't want to serve. They don't want to get involved. They want what the church can offer them. But they want to keep their own money. They want to keep their own time, their own commitments. What's interesting is when you scan this book, it's the exact opposite. We're called to get our hands dirty. We're called to get involved. Look at what Paul says. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul's talking in Ephesians chapter 2, and he says this, For we are God's handy work. Some translation says, translation says we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. Why? Why were you created? To do good work. So if you're here and you're like, I don't know why I exist. I don't know why I'm created as a Christian. I don't get it. It's right here. To do good works. And that's when we, oh, <coughs> what good works? And we stress out. Like, What's my calling? What am I going to do? Where am I supposed to go? God takes all the planning out of it. Because look at the rest of the verse. Which God prepared in advance for you to do. He's told you. He's, he's, he has paved the way for you. You don't have to be like, oh no, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. God has already told you. God has already given it to you. You were created, it says right here, you were created to get involved. Those talents, those skills that we have, you don't just have them for a random reason. You have them for the purpose of serving, getting your hands dirty, loving on people, loving on what the world says, even the unlovable. There's a story about one of the three tenors. One of the three tenors, his name was Luciano Pavarotti. I think I shared this story a few months ago. Luciano Pavarotti wasn't sure which direction to take his life. Well, when he was young, his dad kind of tried to help him. His dad introduced him to the world of music, the world of singing. He encouraged him to work on your voice, develop your voice. There was even a professional tenor in his town that dad hired to help make his voice the best it can be. But at the same time, he was actually going to school to be a teacher. So he had these two worlds that were still that were both going and doing well. He graduated and he asked his father, Dad, should I be a teacher or a singer? I still don't know. 
dad. Luciano, his dad said. Said if you try to sit in two chairs, you're going to fall between them. For life, you must choose one chair. So he thought about it, he prayed about it, and he chose a chair. He said, it took seven years of study, seven years of frustration before I made my first professional appearance. It took another seven years to reach the Metropolitan Opera. He says, now I think about no matter what we're doing in life, if you're laying bricks, if you're writing a book, whatever you do, he says, give yourselves to it. And then he says, commitment, that's the key. Choose one chair. I think we can enjoy life. Enjoy the things God has given us to enjoy, the pleasures of this world. But at the end of the day, we're called to choose a chair. And I pray every one of us that we today, if you haven't yet done it, choose the chair of Christ. Let us pray. Father, we come before you today so excited, so excited about what you are doing here in our church family. We're so excited about this Stronger Together Sunday, where we can focus on you. We can be reminded of the commitment that we made to you, Father. Be with us now as we look deep in our hearts and to make sure to search them. Make sure that you are you are our top chair. You are our top prize. Father, we love you. We praise you. It's in your beautiful name that we pray. Amen. A lot of churches have handbooks, bylaws, constitutions. <coughs> and in our documents, we have written what I'm about to read. So the purpose of Hampstead Baptist Church is to glorify God as a church family, to serve as the body of Christ, ministering to the spiritual needs of the church family, and to seek influence, to influence others to unite with our church family by trusting and receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and growing in their faith. If you keep reading those documents, we also, you also will come across a vision statement. The vision statement of our church is to see our community change. By the gospel and the word of God. If you keep reading, you will find a mission statement. Our mission statement is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Teaching them to observe all that he has taught in the word. And lead us to follow, or lead others to follow, to adopt that same mission. You say, why do we exist? Why is this church here? That is why. That is why this church was planted many years ago. That is why we exist. For those Thoughts, those amazing statements that were written many years ago. You know, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, you find many commands, many commands for you and I, the church, ways that we should act towards each other, how we interact together. Let me share a few of them, a little rapid fire for us this morning. Romans 12, 10, we read that we are to be, to be devoted to one another. Romans 12, 16, a few verses later, we see we're to be in the same mind towards one another. Romans 14, 19, build up one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, be of the same care of one another. Galatians 5, 13, you are not, we are to serve one another. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another. Philippians 2, 3, you are, I am to regard one another as more important than yourself. Colossians 3.13, here's a tougher one. Forgive one another. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, comfort one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one, a letter, one another. And it goes on and on, and I have many more for us of what we are commanded to do. Not things that, oh, that sounds good, but I'm still going to make sure my, my point of view is heard. I'm going to make sure that people know what color I think we should paint, what our sign should look like. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible says. Be very careful with that. And by the way, those are the positive. There's also negative. There's negative commands we are to adhere to. Here's a few. Galatians 5.26. Let us not 
challenge one another. Colossians 3, 9. Do not lie to one another. And it goes on and on. So there's positive and negative commands that we are to act out as a church family. In the book of Hebrews, <coughs> Hebrews chapter 11, it is called the faith chapter. And in the faith chapter, you find story after story after story of faithful men, faithful women of God who had mighty faith did extraordinary things through the power of God. And then you turn the page to chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And in chapter 12, here's the best part. We're invited now to be a part of the story. Hebrews chapter 12 is all about us now being a part. Listen to verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Therefore, which is because of all that happened in the chapter before, all those men of faith, those women of faith, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, it says, let us, that you and I, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. We are to take anything that will hinder you from being the man and woman of God. Throw it off. And then what does it say? Now, <coughs> let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. It's not my race that I am paving the way. No, it's the race marked out by God for me. He's paved the way for me. He's made the way for you and I. And that's how this is a church family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're on the same team. We're in the same platoon. And as today's about, we are stronger together. We are to be committed to one another. Again, we may disagree on, oh, you're going to paint it that color? Oh, you're, you're getting a new sign? I think the sign should be bigger. Oh, I think it should be smaller. Oh, I wish it would have been higher. On and on, the pettiness goes. <coughs> We're committed together for something bigger. The reason we are here, the reason the church exists and our motto, our catchphrase has been lately, is to love God. That's with everything, to love Him, and then also to love others. It's interesting. I don't. It doesn't just say love. Doesn't it just say love people who carry the same version of Bible I use? Love people who dress the way I want them to dress. Love people who talk the way that I have. We are to love others. Anybody who walks in that door, anybody who we see, we are to show the love of Jesus. <coughs> the moment, <coughs> the moment you said yes to Jesus, the moment you, if you are here and you have become a child of God, the moment that happened. The moment he became your personal Lord and Savior and your whole world changed for the good, you became part of the universal church. Every born-again believer in Jesus Christ is a part of this past, present, future, is part of this church. We're part of the universal church, but also we're called to be a part of the local church. That's what this is. We're called to be a part of a local church, but there's times... That commitments can waver in the local church. Some people, we use the term church hop. You know, looking for the perfect church. We're all looking for the perfect church. Now, if you find it, let me know. I'll join it, and I, it won't be perfect anymore. That's the joke. Because once we join it, you know, we'll ruin it. We look for the, you got to have the best preachers. you got to have the fall machines. You, gotta, you know, we want the, the kids, best kids ministries, youth ministries, the best praise band, which we got that, by the way. And so, so they look for what is the best for, then they finally feel at home, and then guess what happens? Conflict happens. Something happens. Problems arise. And then what happens? Oh, we feel called. I use that in air quotes. We're called. Oh, we're not called here anymore. Now we're called to go over here. And that's what happens in our society, but it's completely against the Bible. Because you see, when you read the Bible, you get a totally different picture of what the church is and what it's made up of and what it should look like. The church is a place where we literally, as imperfect, sinful people, gather to worship the perfect and worthy creator. That's what church is about. We grow together. We do life together. We cry on each other's shoulders. You see, it's not about us. We are just have the privilege to worship him. We have the <coughs> privilege to be a part, as we talk about in Hebrews 12. Look at what Paul says in Romans 12. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul talks about the same thing when he says, Therefore, 
I urge you, you can picture the sincerity here. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, what's it say? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. That, this is true worship. And then he challenges us. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but instead... Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, perfect will. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not to be conformed to our world that's ever darkening, ever changing, getting worse by the second. We're not to be conformed to that. We're to be transformed by God, His words. We're to be daily diving in, soaking this up. We have to realize... But when we made a commitment to the church, we made a commitment to Christ. It wasn't something you could flip on Sunday morning and then, oh, 12 o'clock, flip it off. No. It's not something you turn on and turn off. I love Jesus' example of this. Jesus was baptized. And almost like instantly, right after he was baptized, the devil tempts him. Remember the story? Remember the story of the, the devil? He takes him to the highest peak, right? He's there on the top of the mountain, and he says, you can have all of these kingdoms, past, present, future kingdoms and dynasties of our world are all there in display. What an amazing sight that must have been to see, seeing all the different dynasties that have ever, will ever exist. Jesus can see them all, and the devil's like, I will give them all to you. And he doesn't even think about it. He uses scripture, by the way. He quotes scripture and says, no. Why? Why would he say no? Because he understands his purpose. He understands his goal. He is committed to showing up and being our Emmanuel. Paving a way for us. He's committed to us. He doesn't care about those temporal things. He cares about us. Philippians, Paul again, talks about this. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Paul's talking about this, and he says, Not that I've already obtained all this, or that I've already arrived at my goal. I love what he says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, forgetting what is behind, is straining towards what is ahead. And in the very famous verse 14, he says, I press on. <coughs> I press on. Towards the goal to win the prize which God has called me headward in Christ Jesus. When's the last time you pressed on for Jesus? When's the last time I, this is more personal, pressed on for Jesus? This isn't a weekly commitment. This isn't a Sunday hour check. Now on to the next thing. To commit yourself to God means you are literally yielding yourself to Him. You're entrusting your everything to Him. You're relinquishing control. Control is not mine anymore. It is his. I am a new creation. It is his, not mine. That's what it means to be committed to Jesus. I want to challenge each of us this morning to make a commitment for Christ. If you are here today and you've never made that decision, you've never made the decision to be a child of God, have your world change. I'm not saying a decision to attend church. We attend church to learn, to gather together, but then we're called to go out. I said in the early service, how much fun it would be if we could just stay here. Fellowshipping together, laughing together. We're family. How great that would be. But the problem is we're called to go out. As much as fun as this is, we're still called to go. We're called to go there, go there, go there. And it's not easy, but that's what we're called to do. So I challenge you, if you don't know him, that today is a day of salvation. If you're a child of God here today, I challenge you to commit or recommit yourself to being a man or woman of the word. I said this last week as we began a new year. Be a man or woman of the word. Be a man or woman of prayers. Most popular, popular, most powerful tool and weapon you have. I challenge you to commit yourselves to this family. To be a part of this local body of believers. Don't be someone who just nitpicks. Don't just be somebody who makes little comments and jabs. Pastors love that, by the way. Don't be, don't be that person. Be somebody who gets involved, gets her hands dirty. And by the way, there's going to be tough family moments. Any every family we have. 
We all have stories about tough family moments. Financial problems, family with problem with, with the kids, problem with the house, and on and on it goes. <coughs> Potholes along the way, but I started thinking this week, I was putting this together. Can you imagine the Christian life traveling alone? Can you imagine that? I started trying to think what the Christian life, for me personally, what that life would look like if I didn't have other brothers, sisters that I can call, I can talk to, I can cry on their shoulder, that I can get advice from, and on and on. Can you imagine this trip being a solo trip? First off, it would be unbiblical, completely unbiblical. But then just taking that out of it, can you imagine that? Can you imagine just doing it on your, by yourself? Thank goodness we're called to be together, aren't we? C.S. Lewis puts it this way. C.S. Lewis says, Christianity, if true, oh, I did backwards, if false, is of no importance, and if true, is of infinite importance, the only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Now, let me say it again. Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, is of infinite importance. <laughs> For me, the only thing it can't be is moderately important. The Bible is pretty strong about this when he talks about people who are lukewarm. Remember the word? You already know what I'm going to say. The Bible says it's like you are being spewed out of the mouth of God. That's how God views people who are living lukewarm. You are God's vomit. That's how disgusting it is to him. Pretty strong, isn't it? Pretty strong words. He would rather you be hot in love with him like no other or cold and want nothing to do with him. He can't fathom you being in the middle. As soon as you walk out that door, as soon as everyone, when we walk out that door, everything in our society is going to tell you it's about you. It's all about you. The world's constantly telling you that the goal of life is more stuff, more fun. Sadly, you've been lied to. Maybe this morning you've fallen for that lie. There's a movie. It's called The Greatest Showman. And please don't make fun of me for liking this movie because it's a musical. So I, I just know for the rest of my time here, for the next two, three, four decades, you're going to make fun of me for liking a musical. Please don't. Please don't do that. I do make sure my family... Now we're way off here. And they're recording this one, so we're in trouble. But um, I do find Sound of Music to be also another amazing musical. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'm going to hear about this. Oh, sorry. Any gentleman in here, I do apologize. Anyway, there's a movie called Greatest Showman. And there's a very moving scene in that movie. It's very powerful. There's a lady gets up and she starts singing. And it's one of those songs that starts small and gets larger and larger as it, it goes. And if you've seen the movie, it's... She's going on and saying, never enough. Never, never, never enough. It gets louder and louder, and you start getting chills watching it because she's just belting it out. Never enough, never enough. And the preacher, I'm sitting there, the preacher watching it, and I'm like, it's so true. That's how we see the world. We think that it can satisfy. We think it can finally, something can happen that we finally find satisfaction. But I'm here to tell you, because I've tried it, and maybe you have too, the world is never enough. Never enough. You can try this, you can try this, it'll never be enough. And I'm not saying, of course, I'm not, I'm not a killjoy. Enjoy the games, enjoy the fun, but remember, you worship the only one who deserves worship. He's the only Savior. He's the only eternal one. There's a man living in the country of Haiti, he wanted to sell his house. He was selling his house for about $2,000. That was a market down, down there. Houses are a little cheaper. <coughs> so he finds somebody who wants to buy his house. He says, I'll give you $1,000 for your house. He says, well, sir, I'm asking $2,000. He says, well, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll just give you $1,000. It's up to you. You can take it and leave it. He said, okay, I'll, I'll take the $1,000, but I have a caveat. You allow me to hang one nail, one nail above the entryway of the house. One nail, right there above the entry point of the house. 
The guy thought that was weird, you know? Like, why would you do that? I don't, I don't understand. Why would you, why would you hang? Put, why would you want that nail? And he agreed. He said, okay. So about a year later, everything's going good. The gentleman found a new house. The one was living in that house, but he was like, you know what? I want to move back home. He's like, will you sell me the house back? We'll pay the same thousand. Same thousand will be good. And he said, no, I, you, I don't, no, no, no. We're happy here. My family, we love it here. No, thank you. So he finds some roadkill on the side of the road. And he goes to his part of the property and hangs it on that nail. You can picture, don't maybe you should, but picture the smell and just atrocious. It's very wild animals. And he's got young kids. He's like, sir, you got to take that down. And he's like, that's, my, that's part of my house. That's mine. And after a week of the smell and the animals and being scared for his kid's life, he finally relents and lets him have the house. Sells him his house back. So funny enough, you and I would say, it's just a nail, right? What's the big deal? Two inch nail, an inch, whatever it is. I mean, what? It's just something small. It's not a big deal. It's not gonna, it's not gonna change anything. It's so amazing how the devil says the same thing to us, doesn't he? It's just a, just a little, just a little thing. It's something small, it's not a big deal. It's just a little nail. <coughs> not a big deal, it's not gonna impact much. And then he keeps hanging, rotting things up there. Makes it unbearable. For us to almost live our life. Luciano Pavarotti's father says, You and I, we must choose a chair. Paul says in Romans 12, We are, you and I, we are a living sacrifice. C.S. Lewis says, Christianity, if it's true, which it is, is of infinite <coughs> importance. And so as we close this morning, I'll ask you the same question I asked you about 20, 30 minutes ago. What does your commitment to Jesus Christ look like today? What does it look like today? And I pray that today God has maybe opened eyes. He's shown you, you know what, I am helping out here. I am helping out here, but you know, maybe I can help in this area. Or maybe I can help in, I'm not really doing much, maybe I can help in this area. What does your commitment to Jesus look like today? Let us pray. Abba Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for this Stronger Together Sunday that we can be reminded that those people who sit around us every week, those people that we go to the, the dessert bake-off with, those people that we hang out with at Awanas and Youth Group and all the amazing things we do, Vacation Bible School, Trunk or Treat, and on and on it goes. This is our family. Brothers and sisters, we're on the journey, this journey Together, Father. And I pray that we've been reminded of that beautiful truth today. But I also pray we've been challenged to see where our commitment lies. It is so easy, almost scary, how quick we can focus on the temporal, the things that don't matter. God, please forgive us when we make it about things that don't matter. For me, it seems constantly. Please forgive me, Father. Now, as we go into this time of invitation, there could be someone here who doesn't know you personally. They've been in church for years, but they don't have that personal walk with you. God, I pray today is the day. Today is the day that they say yes to you. They accept you into their life. Their life has changed forever. Father, work mightily here today. It's in your beautiful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning as we go into a time of invitation. If you don't know Jesus, what you need to do is say a simple prayer like this. You say, God, please forgive me. You came to this earth. You were born as a perfect baby. You died on that cross for me. You lived a perfect life. Pay the price for my sins died, and then three days later defeated death for us. You made a way where I could never make a way. And then you can say, Jesus, please come to my life. Change me. Make me a child of God. And if you say that, and mean it not in your mind, and mean it in your heart. You'll be beginning the greatest journey there ever is. The journey of a Christian man or a Christian woman. 
Now, what we think is as soon as we say that prayer, as soon as we make that heartfelt prayer, that instantly everything's perfect and the sun comes out. You know, that's what we think, but not too much changes really on the outside. But everything's changing on the inside. You now have purpose. Eternal purpose. Eternal meaning. You're now on a path with your Savior. What a moment that is. If you've never made, said that prayer, I pray today is the day you make that decision to be a child of God. If you're looking for a church home, we truly are family. We, that's what we are. <coughs> I encourage you to join us. We had somebody this morning take part and join our church family. Maybe today that would be a decision that you would like to make. In a few moments, we're going to be singing. I'll be standing right here. You just walk the aisle. And I'll come let me know you want to be a part of our church family. It would be a privilege to introduce you and get you started on that process. If there's anything else, maybe something big, maybe something small. God cares about all those things. We're a church that prays for each other. So again, it would be a privilege to pray with you. So join me this morning in standing as we have our invitation.